The next item of business is Stage 3 Proceedings on the Railway Policing Scotland Bill. In dealing with the amendments, members should have the Bill as amended at Stage 2, that is Scottish Parliament Bill 2A. Members should have the marshalled list and the supplement to the marshalled list and, of course, the groupings. I advise members that the supplement to the marshalled list stated that both Amendments 8 and 9 will be called immediately after Amendment 4. This is not, in fact, the case. Amendment 8 will be called immediately after Amendment 3. And Amendment 9 <laughs> will be called immediately after Amendment 4. Now, did everybody get that? It's all right, I'll keep you right. <laughs> The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshalled list of amendments. Group 1 is engagement with trade unions, and I call Amendment 1 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendments 3, 8, 4 and 9. So, Neil Bibby, if you would move Amendment 1 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 1 and speak to all the amendments in the group. I also declare an interest as a member of the RMT parliamentary group. Members will recall that Scottish Labour voted against the general principles of the Railway Policing Bill at Stage 1. We have consistently opposed the integration of the British Transport Police into Police Scotland and our position has not changed. The purpose of my amendments in this group is to ensure that if the bill does pass later today, that there will be proper engagement and consultations with trade unions going forward. The absence of trade unions from the face of the bill, I believe, is a glaring omission. My amendments would address that. Amendment 1 would add relevant trade unions to the list of bodies involved in the membership of the Railway Policing Management Forum. The forum should not just be made uh, up of rail operators. It should be a place where the interests of workers are represented. Amendments 3 and 4 would amend Section 1 of the bill to ensure that there is engagement between the relevant trade unions and the police authority. Uh, the bill would already require the SPA to obtain the views of interested parties. Uh, trade unions must be counted as interested parties alongside the rail operators, passengers and the other persons and bodies identified on the face of the bill. The Transport Minister has also submitted manuscript amendments in this group relating to Section 1. I agree with the Minister's amendments in principle, but I know that trade unions have some concerns about the way in which the Amendment 9 is drafted. The, the amendment would allow the police authority to judge what the relevant trade unions should be. Uh, we do not know the criteria on which that judgment would be made. I would therefore seek an assurance from the Minister that trade unions organising in the rail sector, the TSSA, ASLEF, the RMT, along with uh, police staff uh, organisations, uh, would be included in the scope of his amendment uh, before making any decision um, on uh, pressing my own amendment, Amendment 4. Presiding officer, we believe that transport unions must be included in the development of any new railway police uh, agreement in Scotland. They must be represented mm -hmm. at the Rail Policing Management Forum and their views must be obtained as appropriate alongside other interested persons or bodies. That is why my that's what my amendments would achieve uh, and I move the amendments in my name. I now call the Minister to speak to Amendment 8 and other amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for, to Neil Bibby for raising the issue of engagement with trade unions in railway policing matters through Amendments um, 1, 3 uh, and 4. Uh, unions representing railway employees of Network Rail or train operating companies clearly have a very significant interest in railway policing and indeed often rely on it for their own safety and security in their places of work. As I've made clear on several occasions, our key priority is to maintain and indeed to enhance the high standards of safety and security for railway users and staff in Scotland. I am supportive of the aims of these amendments of providing unions representing railway staff with additional reassurances on the face of the bill that their interests will be directly represented uh, in mechanisms for engagement as set out 
in the bill. Uh, engagement with trade unions is already covered in provision, uh, provisions in the bill as it stands, but I do recognise the value of making that explicit on the face of the bill as a more direct recognition of their significant interest. Uh, at the same time, however, we should equally recognise explicitly the interest of those trade unions who represent police staff and also the representative organisations of police officers, uh, since officers are not represented uh, by traditional trade unions. Uh, amendment 4 defines the relevant trade unions for the purposes of Amendments 1 uh, and 3, but it defines those unions in a way uh, which would not cover bodies representing constables, uh, because constables cannot be represented by trade unions, uh, or indeed uh, police staff. So while I am supportive of the principle behind Amendment 4, I am proposing, and I have, a brief, have had a brief discussion with Neil Baby on this, an alternative approach here, and I'm bringing forward amendments 8 and 9 with that in mind. Those would put beyond any doubt that the representative groups uh, the SPA must consult with include not only trade unions representing railway operators' uh, employees, such as the ones that he's already mentioned in terms of RNT, as left, uh, but also representative organisations of police officers and unions such as the TSSA, who represent police staff as well. So the Scottish Government supports Amendments 1 and 3. Uh, I would ask Parliament to support them also. Uh, I would also uh, ask Neil Bibby not to press Amendment 4. I'm happy to give him that assurance which he has sought. Uh, and, and as I explained, the wording uh, as his amendment uh, of Amendment 4 excludes unions representing police staff, the TSSA namely, uh, and representatives of police officers. The Scottish Government's Amendments 8 and 9, <coughs> excuse me, would address that and would broaden out union engagement uh, and ensure that the intentions of amendments 1, 3 and 4 is met. So I would therefore ask Parliament to support amendments 8 and 9 in my name and would ask Neil uh, Bibby to uh, withdraw his amendment 4. I have a few members who wish to speak in this section, so could I ask you to be succinct, please? And I call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendment 1 in the old biddy's name seeks to ensure that trade unions join railway operators as members of a railway policing management forum to be established under the terms of the bill. Amendments 3 and 4 also seek to ensure that unions are consulted more generally regarding the policing of railways and railway property, and they define relevant trade unions for the purpose of this bill. My understanding is that the manuscript amendments 8 and 9 lodged by the Minister Hamza Yusuf seek to clarify an error in amendments 3 and 4 as Neil Biddy refers to engagement with relevant trade unions but this would not allow for the inclusion of the Scottish Police Federation, the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents and senior police officers as they are staff associations. Clearly it's important that the views of these organisations on railway policing in Scotland are taken into account, so the Scottish Conservatives will support amendments 8 and 9. However, the unions and the railway staff associations have made important contributions to the scrutiny of this bill, and the points they've raised have been valid and I believe should have been taken on board by the Scottish Government. Sadly, instead, the Scottish Government has remained totally intransigent and failed uh, and has merely brushed aside these concerns during the scrutiny process. In view of what any reasonable person would consider to be a totally unacceptable stance from the Scottish Government, it is not just right, but absolutely, except, uh, absolutely essential that extraordinary provision is included on the face of the bill, ensuring that not just railway operators, but also the relevant trade unions are members of the Policing Management Forum. I can therefore confirm that the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting Amendment 1 in addition to Amendments 8 and 9. And I have Mike Rumbles, be followed by Mary Fee. As far as the British Transport Police <coughs> officers, staff, unions and the wider railway industry are concerned, the speed with which the government has brought forward this bill has come as a major surprise. While discussions have taken place since the bill was published, that has not made up for the lack of prior engagement with those most directly involved uh, and with the greatest understanding of the issues. The fact that the SNP ministers chose to consult on a single option, the dismantling of the BTP and merging it into Police Scotland, has only compounded the unease and indeed anger felt. It's undoubtedly very late in the day but the amendments from both Neil, Neil Bibby perhaps go some way to trying at least to redress the balance and the Scottish Liberal Democrats will therefore 
be supporting them. In relation to the Minister's amendments, I accept the rationale behind them and the fact that while not really addressing the fundamental shortcomings of the Bill, they do at least represent improvements. On that basis, we'll also be supporting amendments 8 and 9. So we'll support all the amendments if they are all moved. Sorry. That Mary Feet, who followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak in support of Amendments 1, 3 and 4 in the name of Neil Bibby. These amendments are important in the first instance because they would actually place trade unions on the face of the Bill. And in its present form, the Bill makes no mention at all of the rail unions or of collective bargaining. These amendments would require the membership of the proposed Railway Policing Management Forum to be expanded to include the rail unions. It would also add trade unions to the list of interested bodies interested persons or bodies to be consulted by the Scottish Police Authority. These amendments recognise the importance of consulting trade unions on the way forward for railway policing and for that reason they have my support. Thank you. John Finney to be followed by Ben McPherson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I too declare membership of the RMT Parliamentary Group. Um, now, the phrases omission and, and explicitly mentioned in the Bill um, have been quoted by Neil Bibby and indeed the Minister, and uh, Neil Bibby rightly talks about safety. I think in relation to, uh, and we will be supporting one, uh, three and four, and listen to what Mr Bibby has to say about accepting the, the government's proposals, but the Railway Policing Management Forum, this, this, if, if the bill goes ahead, this is a very important start, and it's important that the trade unions and staff associations are involved right from the very beginning. I take uh, a different view from Margaret Mitchell. I think there's nothing extraordinary. That's not an extraordinary position. That should be the default position for having a, a, a positive workforce. So we will be supporting these provisions and think that uh, not least for the engagement on the safety issue, which is a recurring theme throughout this debate. Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to in support of uh, Neil Bibby's Amendments 1 and 3 and the Government uh, Minister's Amendments 8 and 9. Like the, the Minister, I uh, support in principle the proposed amendment from Neil Bibby at 4, but I think the drafting of the Government Amendments at 8 and 9 are uh, more in, in, uh, inclusive and comprehensive in terms of broadening engagement and representing officers, specifically the inclusion of the Police Federation of Scotland, uh, for Scotland and the uh, in section, in proposed amendment 8 and also uh, the inclusion of uh, police staff at proposed amendment 9. Uh, so the explicit recognition uh, of uh, trade unions within the uh, management forum and also in terms of engagement with railway users and other interested persons it has my support and I encourage others also. I call Neil Bibby to wind up and to press or withdraw amendment one. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As I said uh, before, there is currently no requirement in this bill to consult trade unions or staff associations organising in the rail sector. Uh, the purpose of the amendments in this group is to address that. Um, I, I therefore will be pressing the amendments 1 and 3 in my name. I have listened to what the Minister has had to say and I would be happy to support amendments 8 and 9 and seek to withdraw amendment 4. I would do so on the understanding that the effect of those amendments is to require the Scottish Police Authority to consult with the relevant trade unions. I hope the Chamber will support that position today. The question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. Now move to Group 2, Training in relation to policing of railways and railway property. And I call Amendment 2 in the name of Neil Bibby, grouped with Amendment 5. Neil Bibby to move Amendment 2 and speak to both amendments in the group. Thank you, President Officer. I move Amendment 2 and speak to Amendment 5. Amendments in this group concern training in relation to the policing of railways and railway property. Amendment 2 requires that any agreement reached under 85K subsection 1 of the Bill include arrangements for constables assigned duties relating to the policing of railways or railway property to have completed personal track safety training. The purpose is not to put constraints on constables, but to ensure the skilled railway policing specialism is protected. Amendment 5 requires the Chief Constable to ensure that any constable assigned duties relating to the policing of railways or railway property have to uh, undergo the necessary training. That should include personal track safety training. These amendments are a refinement of similar amendments submitted to the Justice Committee at Stage 2. Again, the purpose of the amendment is not to place constraints on constables or to interfere with operational matters, but to guarantee that railway policing skills are 
uh, protected. Uh, we cannot do that without amending the Police and Fire Reform Act. Amendment 5 would also require the Scottish Government to make regulations setting out the level of training required. Throughout this process, major concerns have been raised about the level of training that would be provided to police uh, officers, uh, policing railways, and the dilution of railway policing as a specialism. Yet the Bill, in its present form, makes no mention of training at all. My amendments seek to address that. There is a lack of clarity about the costs and new training requirements and the numbers involved. At the moment, there are 200 transport police officers in D Division with personal track safety certificates. There are over 17,000 police officers in Police Scotland. Requiring them all to undergo personal uh, track safety training would have significant cost implications, yet that is uh, what uh, Police Scotland seem to have suggested would happen. Police Scotland gave undertakings uh, to the Justice Committee to return at stage two with details of its training needs analysis and the cost. We cannot consider the information eventually provided to be detailed. It does not properly address needs or costs. My amendments require transparency, with the government making regulations to set out the level of training required. Transparency for the public, for the police and for the rail operators, who may ultimately have to meet training costs through their rail policing agreement. I move the amendments in my name. Before I move on to the speakers, uh, people may have noted uh, a buzzing in the background of the chamber. Uh, I'm afraid there's nothing can be done about that, so I can see people now noticing it that hadn't before. <laughs> All these puzzled looks. Um, can I just ask that we persevere with it and perhaps ask speakers to speak a little louder, um, as some folk are finding it quite hard um, to hear. And I call Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendments 2 and 5 are similar to the ones lodged by myself and Douglas Ross at Stage 2. However, Neil Bibri's amendments pick up on some criticism at Stage 2 and seek to clarify when the requirement for a personal track safety certificate would apply. Amendment 2 states clearly this will be when police constables are assigned duties that relate to the policing of railways. The amendments also include trade unions among the bodies that must be consulted in relation to personal track safety training. At stage one, the committee heard evidence from the British Transport Police Federation, which said um, every officer in Police Scotland who intends to police the railways or go anywhere near the railway will have to have the personal track safety certificate. The National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers, RMT, agreed and stated that Police Scotland would not have access to our railways if there was a derailment or a collision or any trespass on a railway. If Police Scotland officers do not have a PTS certificate, they cannot go on or near the running line. The rail operators all agreed with these statements. It would be irresponsible, therefore, if the issue of training was not adequately addressed by ensuring that the necessary provision in terms of PTS certificates is included um, on the face of the bill. Amendments 2 and 5 achieve this objective and therefore the Scottish Conservatives will be supporting them. Stuart Stevenson, followed by John Finney. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Mr Bibby's uh, amendments are a modest improvement over the previous ones in that they only apply to constables who assign duties that relate to the policing of railways and railway property. The previous amendment basically covered all uh, police. Uh, but let's uh, look at uh, what it means, because there are difficulties with the construction. Uh, via the addition of Section 85M1, uh, to the Police and Fire Reform Act uh, 2012, uh, we have a definition for railway property, and that is a station and a train used in a network. And further, at uh, 85M3, that cross-refers to Section 83 of the Railways Act of 1993, which states that a station means any land or property which consists of premises used as or for the purposes of or otherwise in connection with a railway passenger station or railway passenger terminal, including any approaches, forecourt, cycle store or car park, whether or not the land or other property is or the premises are also used for other purposes. So the bottom line is that the areas to which the amendment would apply 
railway, uh, railway, a train used on a network and a station are very extensive indeed. And therein lies the genuine difficulty. It is, of course, for police who are assigned duties. Well, let's consider a practical issue. Uh, with the heightened security uh, situation that we had, we had Police Scotland armed police deployed on the concourse at Waverley Station. I wasn't at other stations, and I dare say they were at other stations. That falls within the definition caught here. Under the amendment that's proposed today, it would not be possible for those uh, police Scotland, the armed police, to be deployed at Waverley and other stations unless they had a track certificate. Now, I absolutely and 100% accept if we're going on the track and we're close to operational trains, that there are particular issues. But that's not what the amendment actually does. So I think uh, we, we, we're saying we can't deploy uh, constables who are deployed to a urgent shout to station car parks, to booking offices, even to waiting rooms uh, under this amendment without uh, special training. These are areas that I, with no special training, am allowed to access at any time as any other member of the public. There's I'm also sorry, an member, overall, just point, overall point, concluding, presiding officer, there is also the overall point that bluntly training is a matter for the chief constable. He, he or she will know how the police network has to operate and they must make the appropriate decisions. We shan't second guess what we need now or in future. John Finnish, we followed by Mary Fee. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I, I, I absolutely understand that it's concerns about uh, safety that prompt this to be on the bill. I, I wonder if training provision should be on the face of a bill, any bill, to be perfectly honest. Um, the railway industry is rightly uh, a very regulated industry, and uh, Mr Stevenson on my left here quite rightly highlights one of the, the difficulties. I was going to cite a similar situation in Inverness where the armed police on deployment there on the course, co on course, course wouldn't have that. I think we need to draw a very clear distinction between deployment to property and what is the very, very uh, significant concerns of uh, trackside deployment. Um, I should also say that, of course, it's a, it's a very important role for trade unions and staff associations, health and safety, and my former colleagues in the Scottish Police Federation, I absolutely assure you, will be very vigilant on this issue. It is a deployment issue. It is an operational issue. I absolutely support the highest standards of safety, but I don't think we need it on the face of the ball. Thank you. Uh, presiding officer, do forgive me. Can I make a declaration before we move on? Excuse me, Mr. Stevenson. I have a declaration of interest to make. I forgot to make. I'll bring you in at the end of Thank this you. section if you feel obliged. Can I have Mary Fee to be followed by Mike Rumbles? Thank you, Presiding Officer. I raised concerns earlier about the omission of trade unions from the face of the bill, and I also want to raise concerns about the omission of training. In our Stage 1 report, the Justice Committee stated very clearly there are areas of the railways that police officers should not enter without a personal track safety certificate. It was a specific recommendation of the Justice Committee that Police Scotland should provide more information about the consequent costs of training. Police Scotland provided an update that was so generic in nature that it has not satisfied me or many others that there is sufficient clarity about the implications of this bill for officer training. These amendments seek to provide a greater level of clarity and transparency. And crucially, it would ensure that these constables who are assigned duties to police railways and railway proper property are properly trained. And for that reason, I will be voting to support these amendments. Thank you. I have Mike Rumbles, to be followed by Pauline McNeill. Uh, throughout Parliament's consideration of this bill, questions have been raised about how the expertise within the British Transport Police can be maintained and safeguarded. Bold promises have been made by the Minister and Police Scotland about how the bill will help massively expand the capacity of officers with expertise in railway policing. In truth, it's hard to see how these figures stack up on this, and as at stage two, I welcome the fact that Neil Bibby is again pressing the issue. I have to say, I'm not convinced by Stuart Stevenson's contribution. I think it was very much of a red herring. These police officers are to be assigned duties, and if they're to be assigned duties to these locations, they need to be properly trained. The amendments from Neil Bibby appears to address the concerns that were raised in relation to similar amendments lodged at stage two. And on that basis, while I will listen to what the Minister has to say, the Scottish Liberal Democrats are inclined to support Mr Bibby's proposed changes in amendments two and five. Pauline McNeill to be followed by Elaine Smith. 
Thank you, presiding officer. Um, I, I'd really pressed because I wanted to clarify what Stuart Stevenson said when he was on his feet, because um, I'm listening to the debate so far, and what I've understood that Stuart Stevenson is saying is that any police officer that doesn't have the appropriate, uh, has a firearm and doesn't have a training certificate could not uh, attend, well, I have to ask the question, well, what happens just now? It, that would suggest that there is a deficiency. I, I think what, what members listening to this debate are concerned about uh, who will be voting against this bill tonight, which I, I will be, is that there's a concern that a complete integration of the system, we might need to make sure that the police officers who are assigned to transport duties are appropriate. And that is a big concern um, for many members about voting for this bill tonight. And if you are correct, Mr. Mr Stevenson, that suggests that there is a deficiency at the moment if those police officers cannot attend. Are you finished, Ms McNeill? Are you allowing an intervention? An intervention from yeah. Stuart Stevenson. If Stuart to Stevenson. Um, it's a very technical point. It's just the definition of what a station is includes areas where Police Scotland should have free access without track uh, certificates, but of course they shouldn't go on the, on the railway or near the active railway without them. It's a pure definitional issue, not a policy issue. Pauline McNeill. Uh, well, there you have it. I mean, I, I, maybe a technical issue, but I, do, I don't really think that's the case, that firearms officers cannot attend a security breach anywhere in our railways. I think probably the system is probably, I think, to be fair, it sounds like a wee bit of a red thing to me. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I put on the record I'm the convener of the RMT's parliamentary group, and I want to raise a point which is relevant to the training issue. The RMT is currently uh, working with Network Rail and the British Transport Police on the new emergency intervention units, which will respond to incidents in order to improve safety, reduce disruptions and prevent and detect crime. And the RMT is concerned regarding the status of the EIVs if the legislation is passed. So I would be keen on the Minister's comments on that. And I would also wish to support amendments two and five because this could help address such concerns. Uh, quite irregular, but I'm happy to let Mr. Stevenson in for a very quick statement. Uh, I draw attention to my register of interest, which shows I'm the honorary president of the Scottish Association of Public Transport and the honorary vice president of Rail Future UK. Thank you, presiding officer. And I call the minister. Thank you, Presiding uh, Officer. Although they take slightly different routes to, to doing so, Neil Bibby's Amendments 2 and 5 uh, both seek to apply statutory requirements uh, or to the nature and level of training that officers should have in a particular operation, operational policing area. Uh, similar amendments were put forward by the Conservatives at Stage 2, and as I explained to the Justice Committee at the time, neither the Scottish Parliament nor indeed the Scottish Government should attempt to intervene in operational policing by dictating fixed training requirements for police uh, officers. Uh, Neil Bibby said in his remarks that it was not his intention to do so, but by moving his amendments he would in effect be doing just that. Uh, we are aware of no precedent for Parliament prescribing requirements on the Chief Constable in this way, and the Scottish Government cannot support either of these amendments. Uh, John Finney made a number of very pertinent remarks uh, on this issue just now in his contribution, but also during the Stage 2 committee session. He highlighted that the work of Police Scotland covers a wide range of specialist areas of expertise, all of which come with their own distinct skills, requirements, risks, and indeed specialist training. Uh, he, he mentioned at stage two, uh, firearms, uh, dog handling, detecting explosives, and vehicle examinations as just some of those areas. Uh, as he pointed out, health and safety legislation applies to all of those. Uh, we do not, of course, attempt to determine what firearms qualifications, what driving qualifications, and so on and so forth police officers should have. They are operational policing matters. And so, once again, to borrow John Finney's words, we should not be micromanaging the police. It is the chief constable who is responsible for operational policing. His responsibilities include ensuring that officers across Police Scotland have the specialist training they need to carry out their duties. And this is continually kept under review to meet operational requirements. Police Scotland has written three times to the Justice Committee providing details of the work it is doing on training requirements for specialist railway policing. I would refer interested members to that correspondence, which sets out how differing levels of requirement for specialist railway police training will be met. 
It is available on the Justice Committee's web pages. Police Scotland is currently working with the BTP on a detailed training needs analysis, and we should allow those with the expertise to continue on, of course, uh, with that uh, work. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government opposes these amendments, and I would ask Neil Webby not to press them, and if pressed, I would ask Parliament to reject them. I call Neil Bibby to wind up and to press or withdraw Amendment 2. Thank you, President Officer. The Bill in its present form makes no mention of training, yet the post-integration training needs of Police Scotland and the costs associated with that have been a major concern of the British Transport Police Federation, the trade unions and members of the Justice Committee. I would like to assure members, including Stuart Stevenson and others, that I am not seeking a departure from current practice. But without making specific provisions in the Bill, the transport policing specialism could be diluted. Specialist skills could be lost. We cannot allow that to happen. There is enough clarity, there's not enough clarity in this bill about training. There is not enough transparency in this bill about training. That is what my amendments, which are a refinement on stage two amendments, aim to address. And as Stuart Stevens says, said, my amendments are an improvement. Uh, and this is about assigned duties, and that is why I intend to press the amendments in my name. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a, there will be a division. As this is the first division of the stage, the Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Third time lucky. <laughs> We will now proceed with the division on Amendment 2. This is a 30-second division and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 2 in the name of Neil Bibby is yes, 53, no, 66, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 1. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are therefore agreed. I now call Amendment 8 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. To move. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is agreed. I call Amendment 4 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 1. Neil Bibby, to move or not move? Not moved. All right. Thank you, Mr Bibby. It is the first time I've done this. You'll have to be patient with me. Okay. <laughs> I call Amendment 9 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 1. Minister, to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are therefore agreed. I call Amendment 5 in the name of Neil Bibby, already debated with Amendment 2. Neil Bibby to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There is therefore a division. And it's 30 seconds. The result of the vote on amendment number five in the name of Neil Bibby is yes, 51, no, 66, and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move on to group three, review. And I call amendment six in the name of Neil Bibby in a group on its own. So Neil Bibby to move and speak to amendment six. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move and speak to Amendment 6. Amendment 6 in my name creates a review period beginning on the day on which Section 4 of the Act comes into force and ending no later than 12 months afterwards. Section 4 relates to the functions which will no longer be exercisable in Scotland, specifically the functions of the British Transport Police Authority. This amendment will require an independent review of the Act following a review period of no more than 12 months. The review body would be appointed by Parliament and should conclude its work no later than six months after the end of the review period. The Scottish Government should then issue a response no later than six months after that. The Scottish Government may, may then, through regulation, modify the Act in line with the recommendations of that independent review. Any regulations made under this section would be subject to the affirmative procedure. In effect, after 12 months of any new railway policing arrangements being put in place, the Parliament can revisit the issue. President officer, not one of the principal stakeholders involved with the British Transport Police supports this bill. 
the TSSA, the RMT, ASLEF, the STUC, the British Police Transport Police Federation, Abellio Scotrail, Virgin East Coast, Virgin West Coast and Arriva Cross Country, to name just a few. The majority of respondents to both the Scottish Government's consultation and the Justice Committee's evidence opposed this bill. Today, many of the critical issues arising from the consultation and the Committee's evidence sessions remain unresolved. Trade unions tell us that they believe agreements on terms and conditions and pre-legislative scrutiny have been sacrificed for the sake of political expediency. This amendment is a safeguard against a rushed, reckless and irresponsible piece of legislation. This amendment guarantees that this Parliament will revisit integration of the Transport Police. If we pass this bill today, then I believe we will be making a big mistake. If the Government will not listen, then they should at least agree to revisit this legislation. That is why a review is necessary, an independent review on which Parliament will have a final say, and I formally move Amendment 6 in my name. Paul Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Mike Rumbles. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendment 6 seeks to strengthen the scrutiny of this bill should it be passed today at decision time. Given the lack of information provided by the Scottish Government regarding the costs of implementation or the legal structure by which BTP officers will be transferred into Police Scotland, an independent body set up to report on the operation of this Act is not only an eminently sensible su suggestion, but a necessary one. This amendment also requires the report from this independent body that must be responded to by Scottish Ministers in consultation with the Parliament. Should the Scottish Government vote against this amendment today, it will merely confirm the lengths it has been willing to go to in order to avoid thorough scrutiny of its decisions throughout this process and beyond. In the interests of accountability and transparency, this amendment should be passed which is why it has the full support of the Scottish Conservatives. Mike Rumbles. Given the seriousness of the concerns raised in relation to this bill and the likelihood that despite these, given the slavish support of uh, the SNP government received from its uh, Green Party MSP partners, this bill, well they are aren't they, this bill will be passed into law later today. Well, to, look, we have a minority government, don't we? I would certainly urge the Parliament, gosh, I certainly have seemed to, ser to stir some boxes. No, I think I should like to proceed. I would certainly urge the Parliament to take steps to keep ministers on their toes. Well, it's very interesting, isn't it, that uh, the, the, all the negativity about this bill, SNP me members can only heckle. The lack of prior consultation and the determination of ministers to proceed with the uh, can we have a bit of quiet, please? It, it, it's difficult enough because we have a problem with the system without making it worse. <laughs> Mr. Rumble. As I was saying, the lack of prior consultation and the determination of ministers to proceed with the dismantling of British Transport Police and merger with Scotland's centralised police force, the least we should do is place an obligation on the government at this stage to review the bill. That does not seem unreasonable to me as proposed by Neil Bibby in this amendment. Of course, as the Minister knows from the amendments lodged by my colleague Liam McCarthy at stage two, Scottish Liberal Democrats believe a more fundamental safeguard is required. As we'll come on to consider shortly in the context of the final amendment, we believe the implementation of these ill-judged proposals should be delayed until some of the significant flaws can be addressed, if indeed that is possible. For now, however, we're happy to support Mr Bibby's reasonable call for a review in the terms set out in Amendment 6. Call the Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I recognise the desire shown by Amendment 6 from Neil Bibby for ongoing parliamentary scrutiny of railway policing following the integration of BTP in Scotland into Police Scotland, but I do not believe this approach set out in this amendment to be the right one and the Scottish Government cannot support it. There are well-developed mechanisms already in place for parliamentary scrutiny of policing and policing legislation. I'm sure Neil Bibby does not intend to cast doubt uh, on the effectiveness of those, but let me provide a reminder of what they involve. Section 124 of the Police and Fire Reform Act already obliges the Parliament to keep that act under review. And it is that very act which the majority of the Railway Policing Bill makes insertions into. That means a clear mechanism for review is already very much in place via the Justice 
Subcommittee on Policing, under which the Parliament is obliged to review and report. It is also, of course, open to Parliament to conduct post-legislative scrutiny at any time. The Justice Committee's Stage 1 report also asked the Scottish Government to provide a six-monthly progress report to Parliament on the work of the Joint Programme Board. I confirmed in responding to that report that we will do that. Uh, this will ensure that Parliament is kept up to date with progress on the Board's work throughout the period of integration. I am happy to give an undertaking today that the Scottish Government will continue to provide progress reports for at least the first year following integration to provide the opportunity for parliamentary scrutiny through the period Neil Bibby's amendment refers to. I welcome Parliament's keen interest in ensuring that the newly devolved railway policing powers are used effectively. Indeed, it is, fundamental, uh, it is a fundamental premise of this bill that this Parliament should scrutinise how the policing of the railway is carried out in Scotland. This bill is about ensuring that railway policing is accountable to this Parliament. I was surprised at Margaret Mitchell's intervention that she thought the bill had not been scrutinised, particularly as she was the convener of the relevant committee that scrutinised the bill. In terms of Mike Rumble's uh, uh, contributions as well, in terms of Liberal Democrats, I would remind him that his party also supported this bill at stage one. However, I do not believe that we need an independent reporting body and provision for yet more regulations when there are strong and effective scrutiny powers and processes in place already. This amendment would create duplication and potentially confusion. I ask Neil Bibby not to press these amendments uh, at this amendment, but if it is pressed, I ask Parliament to reject it. Neil Bibby to wind up and to press the withdrawal amendment six. Thank you, President Officer. Trade unions and staff associations have described the Scottish Government's whole approach to this bill as being ideologically driven. Despite being presented with different options for devolution by the British Transport Police Authority, they have been singularly focused on one outcome and on one outcome only, breaking up the British Transport Police. The weight of evidence is against them, the workforce is against them. Police officers are warning that the breakup would be unsafe, yet the Scottish Government have carried on regardless. That is why it's important that we ensure and guarantee an independent review if this bill passes today. I welcome the support of the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats and hope the Greens will support this reasonable request. I move the amendment. The question is that Amendment 6 be withdrawn. Thank you. Thank you. There will therefore be a one-minute division as we are not agreed and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number six in the name of Neil Bibby is yes 53, no 65 and there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move on to group four commencement and I call amendment seven in the name of Lean MacArthur in a group on its own. Mike Rumbles please to move and speak to amendment seven. Deputy Presiding Officer, I suppose in a sense for Parliament this represents the last chance saloon when it comes to dealing with this bill. A bill that has been rushed through with inadequate consultation and despite overwhelming opposition amongst those who responded both to the government and to the Justice Committee's call for evidence. As my colleague Liam MacArthur made clear at stage one, and I would say to the Minister, yes, we did support it at stage one to see if we could improve the bill, but obviously that's proving impossible. We've repeatedly heard concerns about the impact this bill is likely to have on BTP officers and staff, on the availability of specialist expertise around the policing of our railways, and even potentially 
on the ability of the railway operators to provide a safe and efficient service to the travelling public. Since that debate, we now know the inspectorate was committed to producing a piece of work on the BTP this spring. The inspectorate's phase one inspection of the efficiency, leadership and legitimacy of British Transport Police was to be followed in the autumn by phase two, involving a joint inspection with the inspectorate south of the border into the effectiveness of BTP. The inspectorate was to use this inspection to identify strategic issues relating to the devolution of railway policing in Scotland and the transfer of functions from BTP and the British Transport Police Authority to Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. Yet the phase one report has not yet been made uh, available. Perhaps the minister can shed light on this. What he can't do, however, is persuade me and my colleagues that this delay will do anything to allay concerns among stakeholders the, the, and the wider public about the gung-ho fashion in which the SNP government is blundering on with this latest policing merger. But we've also heard concerns expressed about the ability of Police Scotland to accommodate yet more structural change. Given that Audit Scotland has highlighted serious shortcomings in Police Scotland's financial management, that many of the savings that were promised by ministers at the time of centralisation, a centralisation which we opposed, have not materialised and they are about to embark upon a wholesale review into policing 2026. In these circumstances, even Police Scotland's severest critics surely would not wish this latest merger upon it. Add to that a Scottish police authority that can't seem to keep out of the headlines at the moment and is on a hunt for a new chair after the resignation this month of Andrew Flanagan and, his looks, and this looks like the wrong move at the wrong time for the wrong reasons. If the government is intent on pressing ahead, there is a compelling case for delaying implementation of the bill's provisions. Amendment 7 in Liam MacArthur's name, which I have pleasure in moving, proposes a delay of 10 years. I'm grateful to Stuart Stevenson this time for his helpful suggestion at stage 2 uh, for this amendment should stipulate no sooner than 2027, which has been taken fully on board. So thank you, Stuart Stevenson. I firmly believe that such a delay is in the interests of policing in Scotland, both our railways and more widely in the interests of the travelling public and in the interest of this Parliament by allowing more time for the ground to be better prepared, even if the direction of travel remains the same. Deputy Presiding Officer, I move the amendment in Liam MacArthur's name. Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Mary Evans. <coughs> amendment 7 delays the commencement of this Act to the 1st of April 2027. This delay would allow the Scottish Government to take into account the vocal opposition to this Act heard both in the Chamber today and from almost every single stakeholder affected by this Act or Bill now as it is. Presiding Officer, from consultation through to Stage 3, the Scottish Government's intransigence and refusal to accept any measure to improve this Bill has been nothing if not consistent. A delay in the commencement of this Act would allow the Scottish Government to take on board the many valid and serious criticisms of the Bill. In addition to this, it provides a much-needed opportunity for the other two options originally set out by the British Transport Police to be considered. With the recent terrorist attacks and the UK still on a serious alert status, this is not the time to rush through potentially dangerous legislation which puts the safety of staff and passengers on our railways at risk. I therefore urge other members, rather than blindly adhering to the party whip, to join the Scottish Conservatives in supporting this amendment. Mary Evans, followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I don't think it will be any surprise that I completely disagree with the sentiments just put forward by Margaret Mitchell and uh, previous to that by Mike Rumbles. And I cannot support the amendment from Liam MacArthur today, which is in effect a wrecking amendment and which would see the delay of this for another decade. Because what would we see happen in Scotland in that interim period 
especially if the Tories' plans in England go ahead. And I think that that's what we'll have to bear in mind when we're looking at this as well. Because let's not forget what it says in their 2017 manifesto. We'll create a national infrastructure police force, bringing together the civil nuclear constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police to improve the protection of critical infrastructure such as nuclear sites, railways and the strategic road network. So why is it one rule down there and one rule up here? And you get the feeling it's because it's the SNP that are proposing it, and that's exactly why they're against it. But there are a number of reasons why I am fully in support of the, the bill as it's proposed today. Because when you look at a map of the rail network in Scotland, it shows that there's a vast area serviced by secondary and rural lines north of Perth towards the Highlands and the north of Dundee towards Aberdeen. Now, this area is currently covered by 28 officers located at Perth, Dundee, Aberdeen and Inverness. And this means that there are literally dozens of rural stations covered during any 24-hour period by only 28 full-time officers on a rotational shift basis. This is approximately a third of the entire rail network, which is over 2,800 kilometres long. And the Cabinet Secretary has already informed the committee that policing of railway incidents that occur beyond the central belt is largely delivered by Police Scotland. And I know that myself in my own area because of the length of time that it takes for British Transport Police officers to respond. Now, by agreeing to this amendment, we would, in effect, to use the phrase used by Mike Rumbles, limit the availability of specialist expertise until April 2027. We took written evidence from Assistant Chief Constable Higgins, who saw this bill as an opportunity to weave railway legislation and other associated elements into the curriculum for probationer training that would allow every officer joining Police Scotland to operate safely in the railway environment and ensure that all officers have an understanding of the requirements of working on the railways, including legislative inputs, policing powers, safe systems of working, line disruption and track safety. You must come to a close, please. I'm just coming to a close now, presiding officer, because it seems clear to me that having well-trained Police Scotland officers, as well as a specialist railway division within Police Scotland, working, and the benefit of working alongside those experienced British Transport Police officers, can only lead to an improvement of service, not just for rural communities, but across the whole railway network, and bolster the services you that we must have close here, the instead sevens. of diminishing them. Thank you. Can I can I remind all members that there is in fact a debate following this stage three deliberation and we're time limited for stage three deliberations. So when I say you must come to a close, you really must come to a close. Claire Baker. Uh, President Officer, in relation to the amendment before us, there are serious concerns about the timing of this legislation and the significant challenges currently facing Police Scotland and the SPA. Audit Scotland identify a financial black hole which Police Scotland are struggling to fill HMICS have just recently identified a lack of leadership and poor financial management at the SPA and we can all point to difficulties arising from the handling of the police merger. As the 2026 police strategy has just been published, our focus must be on building confidence in Police Scotland and delivering a modern police force. Breaking up the British Transport Police has been identified as the most expensive and high-risk option for the devolution of the functions of the British Transport Police. And I agree that this is not the right time to push forward with this merger. Call the Minister. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Lee MacArthur's amendment, which was uh, brought to this chamber on, uh, by uh, Mike Rumbles, is one uh, we also debated during Justice Committee's Stage 2 consideration. Uh, no one uh, in the chamber will be surprised to hear that I strongly uh, opposed it then, and I will do so again. The amendment would delay commencement of the provisions of the bill to no sooner than 1st of April 2027, potentially an even, lo even longer delay than his Stage 2 amendment, as uh, that would have commenced the provisions on the exact date of the 1st of April 2027. Uh, Mike Rumbles has explained uh, his reasons for uh, Lee MacArthur proposing such a delay uh, as being to give more time for the SPA, Police Scotland and uh, others to prepare. Uh, yet in the Justice Committee's evidence sessions, the Chief Executive of the SPA and indeed ACC, Bernie Higgins of Police Scotland, both gave their view that the target date for integration of the 1st of April 2019 was achievable, ACC Higgins going even further and describing it as, and I quote, a luxury. I referred in the stage one debate on the bill to the work of the Joint Programme Board, which is overseeing the overall programme of work to integrate BTP in Scotland into Police Scotland for that date. Through the board, the Scottish Government is working closely with the UK Government, the SPA 
the British Transport Police Authority, Police Scotland and indeed of course the BTP. I gave an undertaking during the stage one debate that we will provide a six monthly progress reports to Parliament on the work of the Joint Programme Board in line with the recommendation made by the Justice Committee's stage one report. Uh, those will provide regular opportunities to scrutinise progress. Our readiness is one part of the picture, but another crucial question is what would happen to railway policing in Scotland in the meantime if we decided to sit back and wait, as this amendment suggests. Uh, Marie Evans, of course, made the, very, made the point very well that the Conservative manifesto for the recent UK elections, as I'm sure members are now very aware, has set out an alternative path for the BTP. Uh, Marie Evans was slightly wrong in saying that it was the UK Tory manifesto. It was, in fact, in the Scottish Conservative manifesto as well <laughs> that we see that the BTP integrated with the Civil Nuclear Constabulary and MOD police into a new national infrastructure police force. If the Conservatives have their way, it is likely that there will, be, there will no longer be a British Transport Police by the 1st of April 2027. Uh, I therefore believe that we should continue on the timescales we and our partners are currently working on. In relation to the points that have been made, I would say it would be please, remiss of any members to suggest that somehow integration uh, would, would compromise safety. Uh, recent attacks have shown that Police Scotland, of course, have provided the armed response and transport hubs. So therefore, uh, I would ask uh, Liam MacArthur or indeed uh, Mike Rumbles not to press this amendment, but if pressed, I ask Parliament to reject it. Can I ask Mike Rumbles, please, to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 7? I would only say in winding up that ACC, in response to the Minister, ACC Higgins' reference to the time frame being a generous one only underscores the other difficulties that uh, ACC Higgins and his colleagues are trying to grapple with. It shouldn't be taken as enthusiasm on his part for being asked to take on this increase in workload and further structural change. I'm not surprised that the Minister is um, opposing this amendment. Uh, it will go, uh, I'm sure it will fall with the help of his green friends uh, and partners across at the other side of the chamber. They seem to be supporting everything the SNP government seems to do. Uh, and it's, in, in, it's interesting, oh, I'm, I've obviously hit a chord because there seems to be uh, dissonance on the SNP backbenchers. I move the amendment. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <laughs> amendment 7 is, uh, clearly um, calls for a division and it will be a one-minute division. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote in amendment number seven in the name of Liam MacArthur is yes, 53, no, 66. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. That ends consideration of amendments on the Railway Policing Scotland Bill. As members will be aware, at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is now required under standing orders to decide whether the motion to pass the bill will require support from a supermajority of members, that is, a two-thirds majority of all members, which is 86. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer has de decided that, in his view, no provision of the Railway Policing Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. I will allow a couple of minutes for members to change seating if required 
before the next item of business. Thank you. Time is now tight, so you'll understand we're slightly over. The next item of business is a debate on Motion 1656 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Railway Police in Scotland Bill at Stage 3. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Hamza Youssef, Minister. Nine minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to open today's debate for Stage 3 of the Railway Policing Scotland Bill. I would like to begin by thanking all of those who have contributed in different ways to parliamentary consideration of the Bill. I am grateful to members of the Justice Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their detailed scrutiny of the Bill and the constructive and helpful recommendations set out in their reports. I also thank members for their contributions during Stage 1, uh, as well, of course, as today. I'm particularly grateful to all uh, of those who took the time to contribute uh, oral and written evidence to the Justice Committee. That input is vital uh, to effective parliamentary scrutiny and it is important that all perspectives have the opportunity to be heard. The Committee's report has done an excellent job of summarising those perspectives and setting out to us how they should be taken into account. We have responded positively uh, to many of those recommendations. Presiding officer, this parliament is now accountable for railway policing in Scotland. I believe the process of parliamentary scrutiny of this bill demonstrates a clear appetite to take those responsibilities seriously on behalf of the people of Scotland. Uh, Scotland's railways are a vital component of our national infrastructure and the specialist railway policing function which BTP provides is highly valued by the Scottish Government, indeed by the rail industry too, by railway staff and of course passengers also. And taking forward this bill, our primary objective is to maintain and enhance the high standards of safety and security for railway users and staff in Scotland. Police Scotland has confirmed to the Justice Committee that its intention is to maintain a specialist railway policing function within its broader structure. ACC Higgins of Police Scotland gave an assurance that for any member of the BTP who transfers, Police Scotland would respect their right to police the railway environment until they retire. Yes, of course. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President. I also thank the Minister for taking the intervention. Um, I did raise an issue during the debate on the amendments, which wasn't actually answered. I wonder if the Minister could comment on it now, and it's what will happen to the emergency intervention units. What will be the status of those if the legislation is passed? Yeah. Well, they will, uh, as was mentioned during the debate, continue to be an operational matter for the Chief Constable, wouldn't it be for the Parliament or indeed for the Government uh, to intervene on that. But it would be fair to say that all of us, whether it's the Chief Constable of Police Scotland, whether it's the Government or indeed opposition members, for every single one of us, the safety of those travelling and working in our railways is of paramount importance. And as I say, preserving that specialist railway policing expertise is extremely uh, important. It's something that we have said we want to see continue post-integration. It's something that ACC Higgins says will continue uh, post-integration. And indeed, I welcome the amendment that John Finney brought forward and indeed was accepted at stage two to put that uh, very much on the, that guarantee on the face of the bill. The integration of the BTP in Scotland into Police Scotland will deliver an integrated approach to transport infrastructure policing in Scotland, bringing railway policing alongside the policing of roads, uh, seaports, airports, uh, and indeed border policing. Integration is about providing a single command structure for policing in Scotland, so there is access to wider support facilities and specialist resources. These crucially include Police Scotland's counter-terrorism capabilities. The size and nature of a single police service in Scotland, uh, in, in Police Scotland, enables them to flex rapidly to dynamic situations. 
We have seen an increase in armed police response, uh, of course, in response to recent events, for example, at transport hubs. That is a response which is not provided by the BTP, it is a response provided by Police Scotland. Another key benefit the bill provides is to directly improve the accountability of railway policing in Scotland to those who depend most upon it. It establishes a mechanism for railway operators to agree with the SPA and Police Scotland on the service, performance and costs of railway policing in Scotland. And as we heard earlier when considering the amendments, this bill places the SPA under an obligation to seek the views on railway policing matters of passengers, uh, railway employees, police constables uh, and staff and others. I'm aware of course that members have received correspondence from the BTP Federation expressing some doubt about the guarantees we have set out on terms and conditions for officers and staff transferring. I would like to repeat those assurances today so that members can be clear that there is no such doubt. I remain absolutely committed to our triple lock guarantee to secure the jobs, the pay and pensions of railway policing officers and staff in Scotland. Just this morning, presiding officer, I was launching uh, the hate charter uh, that Edinburgh City Council have managed to bring forward alongside a number of transport providers to stamp out uh, hatred in all of its forms uh, on our transport networks. And speaking to BTP officers there, they told me too, and they were almost quoting verbatim the fact that they uh, were receiving reassurances around the triple lock guarantee. Now, of course, the devil uh, will uh, indeed be in the detail and the discussions of the Joint Programme Board uh, will be very, very important to taking forward that guarantee and commitment that we have given. On the 9th of May, I gave a clear assurance that the terms and conditions, pay and pensions of officers and staff transferring will either be the same as they currently are or an equivalent level of benefit provided to ensure that transfer on a no detriment basis takes place. On pensions, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice is on record as saying that our starting point is that officers and staff who transfer will retain access to their current pension scheme. Passage of the bill will enable the steps to deliver those commitments to proceed, including secondary legislation in the UK Parliament. While there is, of course, considerable work on the detail that must follow, our commitment to these guarantees is absolutely clear. I would like to address again the suggestion some members have previously made that there are alternative ways of using the powers over railway policing that have been devolved to the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Tories said during the stage one debate on this bill that their favoured alternative was to, and I quote, to enable the BTP to continue in Scotland and across the UK. And that, and I quote again, devolution offers the chance to keep the single British transport police force. It was then, of course, with some surprise that when I opened the Scottish Conservative Party manifesto to the recent UK elections, I read the following, and I will again quote, we will create a national infrastructure police force bringing together the civil nuclear constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police to improve the protection of critical infrastructure such as nuclear sites, railways and strategic road networks. I will on, yes, in fact I will. Oliver Mundell. I thank the Minister for taking the intervention, but does he recognise, although it might not be convenient to the political point he's trying to make, that there is a big difference between consolidating specialist policing across the UK and amalgamating specialist policing into a single police force that deals with all aspects of policing? Minister. Uh, again, the, the member highlights, of course, why there's one rule for Westminster and another rule for Scotland. But what I would say to him is that the precise, one of the reasons we're doing this, of course, is accountability. But the other reason we're doing this, is, of course, is to make sure there's integration between railway policing and other transport modes, whether that's seaports, airports. And if you can accept that that is the case for what he claims is happening uh, in England and Wales, why does he not accept that that is what we're trying to do up here uh, in Scotland as well, to integrate it alongside with airports, seaports, uh, and so on uh, and so forth. Uh, given their manifesto commitment to merge BTP south of the border into a bigger national infrastructure force, uh, I, I would have ex expected that we could have counted on Conservative support for the bill, but clearly, uh, after Oliver Mundell's intervention, that probably will not be the case. Uh, members can now be in no doubt whatsoever that a UK Conservative would do if we left the decision on railway policing in Scotland to them, uh, what they would do uh, if we left the decision on railway policing in Scotland uh, to the UK government. Uh, railway policing in Scotland would still be integrated, but not with policing with the rest of Scotland's transport infrastructure, which is what we want. 
uh, but railway policing would be integrated instead, bizarrely, with the strategic road network of England and Wales and with the policing of nuclear and MOD sites. There is no synergy in that, no logic uh, and indeed no comprehension. I hope no one in the chamber today considers that to be a valid alternative to the one we have set out in this bill. Cap Minister, the time the is taken. I ask Tories, you to conclude uh, and move. The then have effectively called for the abolition of the BTP uh, in their manifesto. Uh, presiding officer, I of course urge members to support the railway policing uh, bill today to ensure that specialist railway policing in Scotland is accountable through the Chief Constable of Police Scotland and the SPA to the people of Scotland. I'm pleased to move the motion in my name. Thank you. Call Oliver Mundell, please. A tight six minutes, Mr Mundell. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's easy when it comes like a bill like, to a bill like this to get caught up in debating the detail. After all, in most cases, that would be a prudent use of our time. But this proposition is not about the facts, the evidence, or what works. We know that for certain, because if it was, this proposed integration would never be before us. Instead, this ill-judged and ill-thought-out idea is before us for one reason and one reason only. This SNP Scottish Government's constitutional and ideological obsession with control. It gets right to the heart of everything that has gone wrong on their watch. To many watching at home, it will seem absurd that we are spending our time debating the breakup of the only division of policing that is working well in Scotland at the moment. Arguably, never in the history of legislation has such anger and ill feeling been invoked to deliver so little? <laughs> Presiding officer, uh, no, I won't at this time. Um, I won't give way, no. I won't give way. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Careful. officer, under this government, we've seen ministers prioritise change for change's sake rather than addressing the ongoing chaos at Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. At a time when accountability, scrutiny and transparency are absent in the line of duty, ministers have, with no hint of irony, had the brass neck to come to this chamber and knowingly ask us to make those problems worse. I won't take an intervention. Oh, that's your choice. Problems, lest we forget, that have been created and which have festered on their watch. It is therefore unsurprising that I, for one, take all of their promises in relation to the, British, to the integration of the British Transport Police with a pinch of salt. Ministers have, throughout this process, sought to plough ahead with a single option. They have ignored the proposals for a different model, which were put forward by the British Transport Police Authority, and they have discounted the many voices who have raised real concerns about their dangerous plan. I know that the Transport Minister has admitted I won't take an intervention. I know that the Transport Minister has admitted in the past that he's no expert in transport matters. Perhaps that is forgivable in SNP land, but what is unacceptable in this case is to ignore the experts. I'm not taking interventions, presiding officer, because the Scottish Government, throughout the scrutiny of this bill, have chosen to ignore the voices of the witnesses we've heard from. There are literally countless organisations who I'll come on to name who have raised concerns. But what is unacceptable in this case is to ignore the experts and to dismiss those who work on the coalface and to suggest that after the failings in police policy that have occurred under their watch that somehow it is still remotely credible to suggest that the Scottish Government knows better. Well, no one is buying it this time. Indeed, the list of those with concerns is almost as long as the Scottish Government's list of excuses when it comes to policing matters. The BTP, the Rail Delivery Group, the British Transport Police Superintendents Association branch, the RMT, ASLEF, the TSSA, ScotRail, Cross Country, Virgin Trains East Coast, TransPennine Express, and even the Samaritans, to name but a few, have all expressed varying degrees of concern. But don't worry, folks, the Scottish Government have everything in hand. It will all be fine until it isn't. And at which point, it won't be their fault and it will be too late to go back to how things used to be. Well, today we have a chance to say no more. We have a chance to draw a line under the mistakes of the past and to learn from them. We have a chance to tell ministers to focus on getting their own house in order, to demand that they divert their efforts to steadying the ship at Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority. 
to leave our British Transport Police intact until we see the success of the 2026 vision for our police service delivered and to see the accountability, scrutiny and transparency in action before we commit to more upheaval. Because if recent experience is anything to go by, sometimes you are better with the devil you know. The seemingly insurmountable and never-ending state of crisis which has engulfed the single police force tells us that integration and institutional transformation can be more expensive, less efficient and deliver a poorer service than just leaving those who are doing a good job to get on with it. To ignore the warnings of the past seems foolish, but to ignore the warnings of the present is unforgivable. This is so plainly the wrong time for integration as well as the wrong model. That is why Scottish Conservatives remain fundamentally opposed to the integration of British Transport Police in Scotland. This legislation is not fit for purpose. We believe that under this SNP government, the risks of a botched job far outweigh any of the supposed benefits. What's more, we believe the reckless way in which this SNP government has bulldozed its preferred option through this parliament will put public safety at risk on our railways. Mm -hmm. Much like a runaway train, we believe this legislation needs to be halted in its tracks. I therefore urge members to vote this legislation down this evening and send this out of touch government back to the drawing board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mandela. Call on Claire Baker. Five minutes, please, Ms. Baker. Um, thank you, President Officer. I would like to start by thanking the Justice Committee for all the work they have undertaken during the passage of this bill. Unfortunately, many concerns have been raised that are still unanswered. This has led us to the position that we find ourselves in today. We have attempted to strengthen the bill and address some of these concerns through the amendments brought forward by my colleague Neil Bibby this afternoon. Whilst we do not agree with the direction of the bill, the amendments passed are a step in the right direction. Uh, they will help to reassure workers and unions about the importance of representation within the new organisation. There is, however, still a job to be done in addressing the training concerns and the concerns over potential loss of expertise. Presiding officer, from the very first consultation exercise we have had, industry experts resist the government's plans to integrate British Transport Police into Police Scotland. Yet the Scottish Government have pushed on regardless, ignoring calls for reflection and fuller consultation, determined to push this bill through Parliament without fully looking at all the options available to them. They have chosen to ignore concerns of staff and unions, and this is regrettable. There have been a number of serious care concerns raised throughout this whole process. There are clear operational and serious financial questions that remain unanswered. This is an expensive plan to fix a problem that is not broken. That is why today we ask the Scottish Government to not pass this bill. We ask them to pause and use the summer recess to engage with the trade unions, with the industry at large and with the British Transport Police to look at all the options open to achieve devolution. We know that there are at least three. Today's bill is only one of those. I want to make it clear that we are not saying that there should be no change. Scottish Labour agreed to the Smith Commission report and we accept the principles that were agreed to one which stated that the functions of the British Transport Police should be devolved. However, we do not agree with the conclusion that the Scottish Government has come to. We believe that we could have positive change and we must be confident the proposal is the right option. Presiding Officer, I remain unconvinced that this bill is the right option. This is a bill that will impact on cross-border rail services. That, according to the evidence heard at committee, has the potential to see a reduction in the effectiveness to tackle major UK-wide issues such as terrorism. This bill could see a loss of expertise within our force and there are, if it's brief. John Finney. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer. I wonder, thank you for the member taking intervention. I wonder if the member recognised that the Assistant Chief Constable gave the example of the policing arrangements the British Transport Police had through the, the tunnel and into France and didn't see a challenge. Claire Baker. There have been serious concerns raised by the British Transport Police Federation and other trade unions who raised concerns at committee around the effectiveness of tackling major incidents and the concerns they have about the breakup of the British Transport Police. And I don't think these have been, or notwithstanding the comments that have been made by John Finney, I don't feel these have been adequately addressed through the process um, of the bill. They certainly have been addressed to satisfy the Can British Transport Police. Can you speak to microphone, please? They certainly Sorry. have been addressed to satisfy the British Transport Police Federation. 
Uh, this, bill, sorry, sorry, uh, this bill could see a loss of expertise within the force and there are real concerns that such in integration will lead to an increased cost for rail operators and to the general public, either through increased fares or reduction in quality of service as operators' funds are diverted to the increased cost of a merger. We have also heard many times that to continue with this bill would impact on the terms and conditions of service for current BTP officers and staff and that future staff will not receive the same terms. None of these concerns have yet been fully addressed by the government and there is no agreement in place in moving forward. Presiding officer, the D Division of the British Transport Police works for us here in Scotland and we should be thanking them for their dedicated hard work, not threatening their existence. This is legislation that has been rushed. There is more than one option for the future of the British Transport Police that would meet the objectives of the Smith Commission, but these have not been given the proper scrutiny or consultation that they deserve. There is the option for a non-statutory devolved model of governance and accountability, which could be achieved through administrative rather than legislative means. There is also the option for a statutory devolved model. We believe that all options should be properly explored, yet instead we have a government determined to put legislation through Parliament that, com cannot, command, command, sorry, that cannot command consensus. The rush to integrate D Division within Police Scotland with overview from the SPA, an organisation which is facing significant financial and governance difficulties, introduces a level of risk to transport policing that is not in the best interest of passengers. This is a bill that has no manifesto mandate, it has no public support and very little industry support. This is a bill with operational concerns and serious financial unknowns. Therefore, this is a bill that Scottish Labour cannot support this afternoon. Thank you very much, Ms Baker, and keeping to your time. Uh, strict four minutes. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Liam Kerr. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I was very disappointed to hear Oliver Mundell uh, attack many of my constituents who work for the Ministry of Defence, please, looking after St Fergus oil and gas terminal. Uh, they are effective as policing across Scotland in all the forces that we have uh, are effective. Police uh, are part of uh, why uh, offending in uh, Scotland is a 42-year law. Now, let's uh, just talk about uh, borders. Uh, Claire Baker has uh, raised the issue of cross-border. Well, one of the things that I think we've slightly forgotten is that the British Transport Police are not a UK-wide police force. They are only a Great Britain police force. Northern Ireland, uh, the police force of uh, Northern Ireland, police service in Northern Ireland, shares responsibility with the Garda Shikona uh, for the policing of the railway system in Ireland. That involves a border between two states. The uh, performance of uh, policing there is no worse. It's broadly similar uh, to the performance of policing here. There are organisational models that we can choose and there is absolutely no reason to believe when we look at that as an example that we should have any difficulty. Uh, Claire Baker again reminded us of the genesis of this discussion we're having today from the Smith Commission and the unanimity that the powers should be transferred to Scotland. If a member of the public sees someone in a police uh, uniform they don't ask what police service they're working for. They won't be aware of which police service they work for. They simply recognize that they are a policeman or a policewoman, and they will go to them for succor, for information, uh, for assistance to report problems, regardless of what police force they may be with. Having a unified system that looks after Scotland has significant advantages, removing difficulties at interfaces. Now, in terms of criminal justice, they are not huge. We know that there are approximately 10 offences a day are dealt with by the British Transport Police in Scotland, uh, and that's 5.5 crimes a day. I'm not, I have to say, quite sure why the figures uh, are, are, are slightly different. Now, one of the questions, uh, one of the points that's been made is, if we should do this, we should not do it now. Well, I'm reminded of the old saying, you repair the roof of your house when the sun's out. In other words, we would be under the most immense criticism if we were to look at reorganizing the way in which we do this facet of our policing in response to a crisis. Far better we do it in, frankly, what's been a quite measured way that's taken place uh, over uh, several years. Now, railway policing is not a new thing. 
the Metropolitan Police opened for business on the 29th of September 1829. Uh, the Railway Police uh, started three years earlier. They've been around uh, a very long time in Guy. Now, can I uh, just uh, congratulate Neil Bibby on what I think has been a pretty positive engagement. He's done something that opposition members don't always get to do. He's managed to amend a government bill. I, I know it took me something like four years before I succeeded in doing that, despite considerable efforts. Uh, so that's uh, a good and useful thing uh, that he's done. Uh, presiding officer, we've had a great debate about safety certificates. And whenever a policeman is close to operational railway, it is important that they have the proper training. I have the complete confidence that the Chief Constable will make sure that such training is provided to officers who have to be that close to operational railways. I think this is an excellent move forward, and I will be very happy to support the government come decision time tonight. Presiding Thank you. Officer. Liam Kerr, followed by Rona Mackay. Deputy Presiding Officer. During the stage one debate for this bill, Douglas Ross, then an MSP, said of these proposals, to forge ahead regardless, ignoring the advice of so many experts and professionals would be the wrong thing to do. As we debate the third stage of this piece of legislation, it gives me no pleasure to note that his words are being ignored. Stakeholders remain overwhelmingly opposed to these proposals. The rail delivery group state, integrating the service is not in passengers' interests. The BTP themselves, warn that a deep and clear understanding of the unique requirements of the railway will be lost. The unions have expressed concerns about the safety of railway staff and passengers, and the RMT, ASLEF, TSSA and STUC explicitly state they oppose it. Cross Country said the plans presented a massive risk to network resilience. And just last week, we all received an open letter from the British Transport Police Federation stating, it is our opinion that the security of passengers and rail staff is being risked in pursuit of a rushed and ill-considered legislation. Virtually an entire industry saying the proposals will lead to increased delays for passengers, safety of passengers and staff compromised, loss of expertise, the dilution of the unrivaled specialism of existing railway policing in Scotland, and yet, like Oliver Mundell's runaway train reference, the government barrels on, ignoring the danger signals and all desperate attempts to apply the brakes. The BTP Federation, and the Commission for Parliamentary Reform have expressed grave concerns about the speed at which this legislation has progressed, and their right to do so. It was introduced on the 8th of December, and the first stage was only debated last month. But according to the BTP Federation, right from the outset, there has been no acknowledgement of our views or those of the police officers because a simple decision has been taken that there is only one option, that of full integration. There's no time, thank you. The people have had no time to fully and unreservedly grasp the consequences and challenges of this legislation. If only we could be confident that they were working off a template that works. If only there was a seamless police merger, which had delivered major benefits for the public, had reduced costs, developed and integrated a cost-effective functioning IT system, increased public confidence, ensured those who deliver these vital services had reduced stress absence and were better able to serve the public, and was operating so well it was crying out for additional major responsibilities, like the Police Scotland merger, or perhaps not. Deputy Presiding Officer, it does not make sense to pursue this merger when the rail operators, the rail unions, the travelling public, the BTP Federation and the BTP itself do not want it, when Deputy Chief Constable Hanstock has remarked that the plans have no operational or economic benefits, on a four-minute time, I cannot take interventions. I'm sorry, there are important points to be made. It does not make sense to pursue the merger when the bill appears to go against public safety. Look, if we're going to rush this, this is the whole problem with this debate. I don't debate, want discussions across the chamber. Summing up can deal with some Thank of the you, points. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Lord Chesterfield said, advice is seldom welcome, and those who need it most like it the least. SNP backbenchers will care little for my advice, but this is the opportunity for the Scottish Government to listen to the evidence, to members across this chamber who, having considered the evidence, refuse to support this misguided bill, and most importantly, to industry experts who have been resolute in their opposition. If there were any doubt as to whether the passing of this bill could prejudice safety, the precautionary principle mandates that members vote against it. That doubt is there, so members must decide 
when voting comes tonight, will they follow the experts, the evidence, the industry and vote against this bill, or will they herd behind Michael Matheson and Hamza Youssef? And if this passes today, then in future, if, God forbid, any of the warnings expressed during this extraordinarily truncated process turn out to be prescient, those who voted for it against the expert advice should remember the voting record doesn't change, and I know which column I want my name in. Thank, Thank you. you. Please conclude. I call Rona Mackay to follow by Neil Bibby. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the Railway Policing Scotland Bill is an extremely important piece of legislation which, in my view, will strengthen and complement the work of Police Scotland. Neil Bibby's amendments and Liam MacArthur's would have, in my view, altered and delayed this essential piece of legislation so crucial to the policing of Scotland. Recent events have demonstrated just how important it is to have a coordinated single-force approach to public safety. Even the naysayers of a Scotland-wide police force now agree that it's working well and that eight legacy forces simply could not have achieved such an effective response to the recent heightened threat level. Of course, the irony of the situation is, as my colleague Mary Evans said, that the Scottish, uh, 2017 Scottish Tory manifesto proposes creating um, a national police force, integrating the MOD police, BTB, and the civil nuclear constabulary. The inference being that it's okay for it to happen in England, but not in Scotland. There is simply, simply no logic to that, and it is rank hypocrisy. Oliver, Oliver Mundell's comments were outrageous, disrespectful to Police Scotland, and simply inaccurate. It was, in fact, simply SNP bad. Presiding officer, integrating BTP with Police Scotland will make it fully accountable to the people of Scotland and the Scottish Parliament entirely as it should be. At the moment, it is accountable to the British Transport Police Authority, the Department for Transport and the Secretary of State for Transport in England and Wales. This is simply undemocratic. With more than 93 million rail journeys made within Scotland each year and another 8 million cross-border rail journeys, it makes sense to upskill all police officers to ensure greater public safety and security of our country. Should the bill proceed after 2019, every Police Scotland officer will be trained in policing the railways and they'll get exactly the same three-week training currently only received by PTP or BTP officers. The specialism of transport policing will be retained. And to recognise and keep that specialism, Police Scotland has confirmed to the Scottish Parliament that a bespoke railway policing unit will be established for railway policing in Scotland to sit alongside the specialist road policing unit already in place. So the ethos and specialism would, not be, in, would be enhanced, not diminished. In addition, as Mary Evans also said, rural areas currently not served by BTP would benefit by having specially trained officers on hand to deal with incidents. Neil Bibby's Amendment 5 uh, wanted Scottish ministers to specify the level of personal track safety training. Does he really want to hand over operational duties to politicians? Does he not trust the knowledge and expertise of the Chief Constable? Uh, Liam MacArthur's amendment would have delayed integration until 2027. It might have been more honest for the Lib Dems just to say they don't want integration. There are currently 285 full-time equivalent BTP officers in Scotland and over 17,000 regular police, police officers. So integration can only improve the service to the rail network throughout Scotland. There was also concern over the transfer of BTP staff, their pay and conditions through the course of integration. However, in December 2016, in a letter to the BTPF, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice gave a triple lock guarantee to secure the jobs, pay and pensions of railway police officers and staff in Scotland. And the Minister today has confirmed that there will be no detriment to pay, pension and no redundancies. It could not be clearer than that. Uh, regarding the timescale of the negotiations process, contrary to the comments from BTPF's Nigel Goodbrand, uh, Assistant Chief Constable Higgins described it as a luxury and said the engagement between Scottish Government and the railway industry have been praised by both sides. You have Reading nine, officer, you have nine ev seconds. <laughs> everyone agrees that British Transport Police do and have consistently done a superbly prof professional job keeping the rail travelling public safe. The integration of railway and that, and, and that, I'm afraid, Ms Mackay, you should look at me rather than just plough on. I did okay. wave my pen. Please sit down. Thank you. I now call Neil Bibby, followed by Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. From the very outset, Scottish Labour have been clear. We uh, support the devolution of the British Transport Police in Scotland, but we cannot support the dissolution of the British Transport Police in Scotland. The path the Government have chosen 
is the wrong one. And make no mistake, this is a choice, a political choice, not a necessity. And Labour will oppose the SNP's attack on the British Transport Police, and we will also oppose in the House of Commons any attempt by the Conservative Government to attack the British Transport uh, Police. There are alternatives to the dismantling of the British Transport Police, as we know it, and its integration into Police Scotland. Alternatives that were set out by the British Transport Police Authority. Alternatives many in the rail industry believe they were never given serious consideration. I remind the Chamber what the Rail Delivery, Delivery Group has said about it. They said, and I quote, the reason behind the undertaking, the, in, the integration, is because it can be done, as opposed to there being a well set out argument as to why it should be done. The British Transport Police Federation have said, there has been no acknowledgement of our views or those of police officers whom we represent because a simple decision has been taken that there is only one option, that of full integration. It is shocking that this government is ignoring the fundamental views and concerns of our police officers. The TSSA, who represent the BTP staff, have also said the, the idea of integration is first and foremost that of a political agenda that overrides the implications for policing. Presiding officer, we have before us a bill that will break up a police service that has been subject to more HMIC reviews than any other in the country. It has consistently been found to be efficient, to be cost efficient and to carry the confidence of the travelling public. Not one of the principal stakeholders involved with the British Transport Police believes this is necessary. Not one believes that it will make the policing of our railways any better or passengers any safer. Not the officers, not the staff, not the train operators, not the rail unions. And I have to say, if the train operators and the rail unions agree, then surely we should be listening. I'll take an intervention briefly. Minister. Claire Baker said that the status quo is not an option. She's correct. The member has had since 2014, when the Smith Commission conversations took place, to decide what their alternative would be. Can he at least give in his last minute and a half or odd at least an indication of what uh, model he proposes for British Transport Police. We, ha we have to ready. listen to the concerns of officers, staff, train operators, rail unions. We have to go back to the drawing board and look at this again. This is a big mistake that you are making. When the Justice Committee took evidence at stage one, the majority of respondents raised concerns about terms, conditions, pension rights of BTP officers and staff. The First Minister said in the Chamber last week that assurances will be given to the workforce and they've been reiterated today, yet still no agreement has been reached. And I hear what the Minister said, but as recently as last Tuesday, the BTP Federation wrote to MSPs to say that staff associations had yet to be included in any discussions. Scottish Government and civil servants are paying lip service to this crucial aspect of the process. That's what our police officers are saying. Despite the amendments today, which are welcome, um, the rail unions will still strongly oppose this bill and merger. And they have warned that because of what they call the Scottish Government's intransigence, there could be industrial action on our railways. Not just action to protect jobs and conditions, but action to protect a service that makes an invaluable contribution to public safety. Nigel Goodband, Chair of the British Transport Police Federation, wrote to the Transport Minister personally warning that it would be imprudent to go ahead with the integration when a terrorist threat is severe and that transport hubs are a target. He said... British Transport Police Federation firmly believes that the travelling public and the railway staff in Scotland will be safer if they continue to be policed by officers of the BTP in the face of such a threat. These are grave and serious warnings. It would be unthinkable that these warnings should be ignored. And police officers should be focused on protecting the public and doing their job and not implementing a merger that nobody wants. Even Please stop there. I was letting you stop at that point. I'm sorry, we have very short time. Ben McPherson, followed by John Finney. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I too will be supporting this bill at stage three and the integration of railway policing into the overall structure of Police Scotland. And I will be doing so for two main reasons, because this isn't change for change's sake, as has uh, been alleged from the opposition benches. This is about enhancing the provision of policing on our railways and maintaining the specialism from BTP and making that part of Police Scotland's holistic service. Integrating BTP with Police Scotland is an opportunity to improve railway policing in Scotland. 
Integration will enhance railway policing in Scotland by allowing direct access to the specialist operational resources of Police Scotland. As Assistant Chief Constable Higgins echoed when he had told the committee, uh, when he would be appeared before the committee, this is a sensible move. Police Scotland currently looks after the entire transport network in Scotland, so it is sensible for it to look after the rail network as well. Assistant Chief Constable Higgins has also talked about the extra capacity that will be available, stating that the reality is that Police Scotland is the second largest force in the United Kingdom with some 17,000 officers and assets that are simply not available to the British Transport Police D Division. Although at present in uh, Police Scotland will deploy assets on request, they will be routinely deployed should integration take place. That will lead to greater effectiveness and efficiency and, in his view, a greater ability to deploy more resources to locations that currently do not receive such support. Furthermore, Chief Constable Crowther from the British Transport Police themselves has stated that Police Scotland has the full range of specialist capabilities available to it in terms of operational capabilities. Police Scotland has everything that it needs to police the railway in Scotland. And it has been alleged by the opposition in this debate today that the operators are uh, in, in opposition to this legislation. And, and let me quote Graham Micklejohn from the Trans Pennine Express. There is an opportunity for things to improve in Scotland and for the force in England and Wales then to up its game and improve as well. This, there is an opportunity for improved efficiency. Darren Horley from Virgin Trains. For, from a Virgin Trains point of view, this legislation is an opportunity. So it is not correct to state that the view of operators are solely against this legislation. That is simply not true in terms of the evidence that committee received. This bill provides an integrated approach to transport infrastructure policing, bringing railway policing alongside the policing of roads, seaports, airports and border policing, and it is right to integrate it in that way. And with my time remaining, I would like to focus on the maintenance of the specialism of railway policing within the proposed legislation. It was said at committee that it was important to maintain the specialist unit and, and, that, and, and enhance that through the service that is envisaged, but also to maintain the, e the ethos. And I was assured by the Cabinet Secretary that the current ethos is to be recognised and maintained and taken forward in how re railway policing is delivered. And indeed, uh, uh, Assistant Chief Constable Higgins also assured that there is a very strong ethos in BTP which we would want to retain. One of Police Scotland's strengths is not necessarily our single ethos or aim of keeping people safe, but the multiple cultures that we have within the organisation. He has also stated that it is his intention to have a bespoke transport unit within Police Scotland and that this would sit alongside railway policing. There would be two separate entities under that overarching command and that reassures me that the, the specialist railway policing function would may, be maintained within the broader Police Scotland structure. The Minister also assured on issues of abstraction in, it, it, uh, in our stage one debate and I'm grateful and reassured by that too. And on that point, I will conclude on time. Thank you very much, Mr McPherson, your cooperation. Paul John Finney to be followed by Mike Rumbles, please. Uh, uh, thank you, President Officer. I have to say, as a former police officer, I'm a long-time supporter of the BTP being integrated with the, the, um, the police forces and now force in Scotland. Uh, as my colleague Stuart Stevenson said, there, there isn't, uh, the public don't differentiate in the way some of us might imagine. And I, but however, I do accept that people hold very strong views on both sides of this argument. And I think it's important, uh, and many members who have differing views um, ha have expressed these views, recounted other people. I have to say the Conservative spokesperson Oliver Mundell's speech I thought was shocking. I noted that he, was un he, he seemed fair chuffed with himself and, and was on the, probably on the social media uh, uh, prof professing um, his good work. But I have to say, this is a debating chamber. The idea is that we debate the issues. I'm very happy to concede time for Mr Mundell to stand up and apologise to the police officers he slighted during his speech. Because language is important too. And when I see phrases like uh, dangerous, there is nothing dangerous about Police Scotland. 
Of course, there are challenges in any part of the public sector. There are no dangerous practices being followed there. When people talk about this legislation being bulldozed, if anyone has a complaint about the process being followed here, if it hasn't followed agreed parliamentary process, then I would anticipate quite rightly there'd be an objection went to the presiding officer about that. That has been repeatedly said, and it's unhelpful because we want to have an informed debate. And there are people who have strongly opposing views to me who have contributed to that debate, but not in an offensive way. I have to say, I would ask Mr. Mundell to reflect on many of his comments. Um, when, I, when I started in the police, um, the ethos was guarding, watching and patrol to protect life and property. In 1976, I was at the same college as officers from British Transport Police. We all went back to our respective forces and we did our local procedures. Me being an officer in Leith, that was the Edinburgh Corporation order. For many, it was the Borough Police Act for transport officers. It's very much the same legislation. Yes, I'm that old. Uh, very much the same legislation as they're doing now. And the additional training. The differences were in the funding model, but importantly, the differences were in the accountability model. And what's changed significantly since 1976 is the accountability of police in Scotland. And I don't see how anyone can take offence that someone who could deny a citizen their liberty can take offence that there being parliamentary scrutiny of that in Scotland. Indeed, Cabinet Secretary Minister, I would like to see that extended further. As you know, I have concerns about some of the UK forces that operate and their accountability in Scotland too. So I don't think that, uh, that, that there should be an issue about that. I accept that British Transport Police officers genuinely have a heartfelt view about the ethos they follow. This is about safety, it's about keeping the system moving and I get that, absolutely get that. And it's for that very reason and when you introduce a cash imperative, which will be with uh, uh, police in Scotland to, to ensure that uh, their contracts met, that I can't see. No one in their right mind is going to suggest that we'll uh, alter a, a working model. Indeed, as I've suggested, the very, very fine way that British Transport Police officers uh, and their support staff deal with the tragedies of fatalities on the line, perhaps there's something that can be learned by Police Scotland because they can turn around things very quickly, whereas sometimes, as we know, our major trunk roads are held up for a considerable length of time. There are challenges. Of course, there are challenges with terms and conditions. My uh, support and my party support was absolutely conditional on there being a no detriment to terms and conditions. I have to say, I didn't think it was a particularly helpful letter from the British Transport Police Federation last week. Never mind that it contains some inaccuracies. This is a very challenging issue, the actuarial projections around the, the pensions and the, the change status. I, I've taken reassurance. I would encourage people to take reassurance about that and I would encourage people to be supportive of the police officers moving forward under an integrated service. Thank you. Thank you, Colm. Mike Rumbles, before by Maurice Corrie. Clearly, this is a bill that has not had its critics to seek. A majority of respondents to the government's initial consultation range from sceptical to hostile. The committee's call for evidence attracted a similar response, if not more so. And on listening to Ben McPherson and John Finney just now, one would think that the centralization of the police service throughout Scotland over the last few years has been a marvelous success. Well, I'm very surprised, and I'm particularly surprised with John Finney's experience that he thinks that way. I've had him 30 seconds at a four minute speech I don't have time, I'm afraid. While Scottish Liberal Democrats were prepared to see if these concerns could be addressed during the courses of stage two and three, it has become abundantly obvious that this would not happen. Ministers and others made up their minds long ago, and John Finney said it again, long ago that they were right, and the majority of those in the sector, including British transport police officers, staff, railway operators, were all wrong. That is neither sensible nor healthy, though it is sadly characteristic. Of course, from the outset, ministers have argued that this bill simply implements the will of the Smith Commission. Nonsense. It reflects the SNP's interpretation of Smith. Merger was only one of three options identified by the BTP Working Group. It was also the one with the highest degree of risk and opposed by most stakeholders. Sadly, no attempt was made by the government or others to seek views on other options, options that would have minimized disruption to a service that time and again, the committee heard, is operating efficiently, effectively, and in a highly professional manner across the UK. That failure to consider or consult on other options undermines the minister's case. So too have concerns about how the specialist expertise 
of the British Transport Police can be maintained and developed post-merger. Concerns too about how railway policing agreements are likely to operate, costs assigned and potential disputes resolved, and concerns about Police Scotland's ability to take on these additional functions and responsibilities while still facing very serious ongoing challenges as a result of the botched centralisation driven through by this government. All along the way, all along the way, the response from ministers to these concerns has been to minimise or reject rather than address and allay fears. In fairness, given the ill-conceived nature of these proposals, both in content and timing, it may be that ministers have made the best of a bad job. However, it remains the case that this is a bad job of their own making. In large part, that goes to the heart of the amendment I sought to get accepted earlier this afternoon. If the flaws in the approach being taken by the government cannot be addressed in the time available for Parliament to consider this bill, then the only responsible thing to do is to delay its implementation. Now, the case for such a delay is strengthened, I believe, by what now appears to be delays in the work of the inspectorate in relation to the British Transport Police. If this minority government and their Green partners still choose to reject such a delay as they have, if they prefer instead to plough on with the dismantling of the British Transport Police and merge it with Police Scotland based on political ideology rather than practical insight, and if they refuse to accept the serious misgivings that continue to exist within the sector and amongst the wider public, then there is only one sensible course of action for this parliament, and that is to reject this bill. And that is what Scottish Liberal Democrats will do at decision time today. Thank you very much. Um, I call Maurice Corrie, to followed by Foot McGregor. Maurice Corrie will be the penultimate speaker in the open debate. And I thank both gentlemen for accepting your time cut to two minutes each, just to let you get in. Mr Corrie. Thank you, Deputy Prime Officer. My pleasure. I rise today to oppose the Railway Policing Bill put forward by the Scottish Government. The SNP has decided to tear up this established British specialist. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. The SNP has decided to tear up this established British uh, specialist policing unit, despite the fact that the British Transport Police is an established and successful model. The Deputy Constable of the British Transport Police stated that we have not been able to identify any operational or economic benefits in merging with Police Scotland. If it ain't broke, why fix it? Why uh, did they go down the road of what the Transport British, uh, Transport Police, British Transport Police Authority described as the most complex option? Why did the Scottish Government decide on this course and not follow the simpler option which would save time and money? That, that simpler option is the one that we, the Scottish Conservatives, have set out. This would lead to an improved level of accountability to Parliament, and I would urge all members to reject this merger. Clear operational issues will arise, as first highlighted by our late colleague Alex Johnson in 2015. We face the ridiculous possibility that the BTP officers having to get off a train before Scotland to be replaced by officers from the single Scottish police force. We can also avoid the security risks that the SNP plan threatens to cause. The Chief Executive of the BTP Authority stated that they have identified several hundred security risks that will be caused by the merger. Not a very sensible thing to do in these uncertain security times. The experience from the Dutch Railways also shows that the withdrawal of dedicated railway police and service and integration with the National Police Force can lead to a loss of specialisation and specialism, leading to less effective policing and increased danger for the commuters. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, the lack of support for this bill from the public, the police and the railway operators is clear. We in this chamber should listen to them and reject this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I call Fulton McGregor, last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, so I'm pleased to be able to speak in this debate today, uh, and I thank you for allowing me to be able to speak at all, even though my, my time is, is cut. As a member of the Justice Committee, I would like to pay tribute to all of my fellow committee members and those who gave evidence for scrutiny of this bill, and I, like my colleagues, will be uh, pleased to support the bill at the Stage 3 amendment today. I think it is always worth remembering that the devolution of BTP was agreed by all parties through the Smith Commission. It has also been Scottish Government policy for some time, and I believe that the integration of the British Transport Police into Police Scotland will provide a more integrated and effective approach to infrastructure policing in Scotland and assure, ensure that it is accountable to the people of Scotland. Now, I, 
Given my time has been cut, I'm not going to uh, stick to what I'd originally planned to say, President Officer, but I would like to comment on Oliver Mundell's um, comments earlier. I think why most people that I've made mention of them since, in, including what I'm going to say myself, why we've been so surprised is because Mr Mundell has, a, I, I think, through committee, always seek to, to gain consensus and, and worked hard within committee. And I think that his, his outburst today was rather surprising um, and maybe more um, akin to other colleagues on the committee previously. Um, I, I, I think for him to say that the SNP are, coming, uh, are, are carrying on with this policy uh, based on constitutional factors is totally absurd. And indeed, I think from what we've heard today from Mary Evans and the Minister in terms of Conservative policy uh, down south, um, I, I would actually say that on the contrary, it would appear to be Mr Mundell and his party that are, um, are looking for the bill not to go ahead because, um, because of constitutional lines. Uh, and I would like to say that there, and, uh, and I was disappointed with uh, the contribution from Mr Mundell today, but I'm sure going forward he will look to work um, with us. As I've said already, I've got two minutes and I support the, uh, the motion by the Minister tonight. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I call on Mary Fee to start our winding up speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have here a bill today that is unnecessary and unwanted. And I warned, along with colleagues on these benches, that the Railway Policing Scotland Bill is an example of the Scottish Government attempting to fix something that's not broken. There is little support for this bill from those involved in the operating of our rail industry and the officers on the ground who protect passengers on a daily basis. And, presiding officer, due to the limited time available to speak today, I won't be able to cover um, points made by colleagues Neil Bibby and Claire Baker and others across the chamber. And this is possibly indicative of the rush nature of this bill, something the British Transport Police Federation has expressed concerns about. And in closing, I think it's worth repeating the many concerns that have been raised during the passage of this legislation. Scottish Labour does not support the general principles of this bill. The integration of the British Transport Police was not a part of the Smith Commission. Indeed, we agreed to the devolution of the function of railway policing through the Smith Commission. That yet there was no agreement what that devolution would look like, nor does any party have a manifesto commitment to integrate BTP into Police Scotland. And although we lodged amendments for the Stage 3 proceedings, this was to enhance parts of the Bill that unions wanted to see improved. And it is crucial that the very real concerns that unions raised are included on the face of this Bill. And we shall still vote against the Bill at decision time, regardless of what the final Bill looks like, as it is not in the interest of rail passengers, rail workers, rail operators, nor the skilled and experienced staff of the British Transport Police. Last week, Nigel Goodband, Chair of the British Transport Police Federation, sent MSPs a stark and important letter highlighting serious concerns about the Bill's process to date and its knock-on effect on rail safety. We know the SNP doesn't like to listen to opposition parties, but they should be listening to those who know more about the safety and security of rail transport. They are the transport and policing experts, not Hamza Youssef, as the Minister rightly conceded last year. During the committee's evidence sessions with stakeholders, we heard that the potential of skilled and experienced BTP officers leaving the service was very real. Now we have Mr Goodband writing to MSPs, telling us that some have already sought transfers and more planned to if BTP is integrated with Police Scotland. The uncertainty attributed to this bill is directly the responsibility of the Scottish Government with this unnecessary legislation. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government are making the wrong choice by progressing this merger. The TSSA, the RNT, ASLEF and the BTP Federation all oppose this. And I, as I warned at stage one, for serious and justifiable reasons, as Claire Baker and Neil Bibby have already pointed out today. The TSSA believe that the merger is being pushed by a political agenda, not an agenda for the safety and security of our rail network. This is the last chance to stop and think about the wider range of options that were and still are available to the government. And that is why we are calling on the Scottish Government to pause their plans for Parliament and, and to reject this bill. 
Let us use the summer recess to fully consult on all options for the devolution of the functions of the BTP. Let us work with the industry, with the staff and with the public and reach a consensus on the future of railway policing. And I would urge members across the chamber to vote against this bill, as Scottish Labour will do at decision time tonight. Thank you. And I call on Margaret Mitchell to close with the Conservative Party. Presiding officer, this stage three debate on the Railway Policing Scotland Bill is one which affords me no pleasure to speak in, given it's self-evident that at the conclusion of the debate, the SNP, with the support of the Greens, will vote this bill through. This despite the warnings from stakeholders that the merging of the BTP into Police Scotland will pose the risks to security. To quote the Chairman of the British Transport Police Federation, the railway network can ill afford to have a lower standard of security and protection at a time when the threat from terrorism remains severe. These warnings have fallen on deaf ears. Why? Well, by way of background, it's true, as Fulton McGregor said, that this bill stems from an agreement by all parties represented on the Smith Commission that the functions of the British Transport Police in Scotland will be a devolved matter. In response to this agreement, the British Transport Police and the British Transport Police Authority then set out a three options paper for the proposal to be accomplished, namely one, administrative devolution only, two, a statutory devolved model of governance and accountability with BTPA retaining responsibility for railway policing in Scotland and three, full integration of BTP into Police Scotland. The Scottish Government has only considered the full integration of BTP into Police Scotland option and just as it did with ill-conceived name, named person legislation, it has dogmatically stuck to this option as a consequence of an SNP manifesto pledge. In doing so, it has totally ignored the evidence from stakeholders about the potentially dangerous consequences of full integration. Starting with the expertise lost with the exodus already beginning of experienced BTP Scotland officers as a result of the complete failure of the Scottish Government to give these officers the guarantees they seek through debate and negotiation regarding jobs, pensions and pay. Both Liam Kerr and Mary Fee referred to, in an open, referred to the open letter to all uh, Scottish Parliament me members sent last week in which the BTPF stated that officers are already seeking transfers or leaving policing altogether and that we believe the Scottish Government and civil servants are paying lip service to this crucial aspect of the process. The letter plainly states that the BTPF still has no confirmation even on the legal mechanisms the Scottish Government intends to use to transfer BTP officers into Police Scotland. Our questions have gone unanswered by the Scottish Government. This is an indefensible situation to be at during stage three of the legislative process. Added to these concerns are issues highlighted by rail, rail operators um, which fund the BTP in Scotland and include ScotRail, Virgin, tra Virgin Trains and Cross Countries. These concerns include the cost of training police, uh, Scotland officers, which the committee recommended should not be borne by the rail operators, the loss of BTP specialisms, such as reducing cable theft and assessing bomb threats, which help to minimise the impact impact of incidents on a UK-wide rail network and the fact that Police Scotland officers will require personal track safety certificates which both Douglas Ross and myself addressed at stage two and Neil Biddy's amendment sought to address at stage three. To put this in perspective, the BTP written submission stated that over a 10-year period, 2.5 million unintended items were assessed by BTP's officers using carefully deployed procedures. Furthermore, our rail network is UK-wide with 8 million passengers, journeys and 2 million tonnes of freight crossing the border each year. So the BT Transport Police Superintendents Association stated causing the introduction of dual controls at border 
uh, at the border with different bomb threat categorisation arrangements will introduce an element of risk. In conclusion, presiding officer, this bill is a product of the now increasingly discredited current scrutiny process, causing those who police and run the railways to conclude that the security of passengers and rail staff is being risked in pursuit of rushed and ill-considered legislation, which is why the Scottish Conservatives did not support the general principles of the bill at stage one and will be voting against the bill this evening. Thank you very much. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson to conclude. Thank you, Convener. I'm very grateful for the contributions which we've received this afternoon for this uh, stage three debate on the railway policing uh, bill. Like some members, um, I want to uh, pick up on uh, the points that were made by Oliver Mundell in his contribution during the course of this Stage 3 uh, debate. Uh, not only do I think they were ill-considered, I actually think they were shameful yeah. in the way in which you attacked Police Scotland officers in the sterling work that they do for us day in, day out, right across this country. I accept debate is an important thing, and I accept that Oliver Mundell might not agree with the approach that we are taking with railway policing here in Scotland. But to try and make your case by slagging off Police Scotland officers for the work which they are doing, I think, I think deserves an apology, and I hope that Oliver Mundell will reflect on that after this debate. <laughs> we have police officers who have just stepped down from the country going to critical that has meant the rest days have actually been cancelled, where they've had to make sure that we are keeping our communities safe, our major transport hubs safe, doing that to keep people like Oliver Mundell safe and to slag them off in carrying out that work, I think is ill-befitting of someone who's meant to be in the Conservatives' front bench here. But the other fact that has amazed me in the course of this debate is the sheer hypocrisy from the Conservative Party they want to list all of what they see are the concerns about BTP in Scotland being integrated into Police Scotland. But what they don't want to recognise is that they're going to abolish British Transport Police by creating infrastructure policing, an infrastructure policing force in the UK, bringing together the Civil Nuclear Constabulary, bringing together the MOD Police and bringing together BTP policing. It wasn't just in the UK manifesto, it was in the Scottish Conservative manifesto yeah, yeah. as well. <laughs> but we have a party who's quite happy to stand here and lecture us about the approach we should take here in Scotland, but are not prepared, not prepared to stand up and defend their own position and the approach that they're taking in England and Wales. And it just demonstrates the hypocrisy at the heart of a Conservative Party. And the reality is, you take your orders from London, certainly not from Scotland when it comes to these issues. And if the Conservative Party won't to give anybody lectures about policing, one, par one party I won't take a lecture from when they talk about the dangers of policing is a party that cut 20,000 police officers in England and Wales that resulted in, resulted in the military having to go onto the streets in England and Wales because they didn't have enough armed police officers when we went to critical. So don't come in here and lecture us in policing given your own track record in England and Wales. Then, officer, can I turn to the issues that have been raised by members in the course of this debate? Some of the constructive issues that have been raised in the course of this debate rather than the childish point scoring that we've had from the Conservative Party in the course of this debate. Claire, Claire Baker raised the issue about the time frame for taking forward this legislation. Let's keep in mind, the Scottish Government set its position out on the integration of BTP into Police Scotland back in 2011. We reset it again in 2013, then in 2014. This should come as no surprise. In our submission to the Smith Commission, we actually set out the integration was the approach that we would want to take. But when members raise issues about concerns of the parliamentary process and how quickly this bill has moved through Parliament, as was described surprisingly by the convener of the Justice Committee, this discredited scrutiny process, the convener of the committee that scrutinised the bill, is that the time frame for dealing with that is a matter for Parliament. It's not set by us. 
We introduced the bill into Parliament. It's for the Parliamentary Committee and the Parliamentary Process to consider these issues. So we haven't rushed anything through. And as a minority, we've had to build support for this particular build with other parties here as well. So the idea that we've railroaded it through and we're not listening to anyone given the amendments that we've accepted from the Labour Party here today is simply not the case. But I want to turn to... I'll give way to the member, of course. Neil Bibby. The, the, the British Transport Police Federation said there has been no acknowledgement of our views or those of the police officers whom we represent because a simple decision has been taken that there is only one option, that of full integration. I'll tell you who's not listening to. He's not listening to British transport police officers that think this is a huge mistake and it's going to come back and bite this government. Cabinet Secretary. Officer, we've set out, we've set out our position very clearly on the policy of integration of uh, policing into, railway policing into Police Scotland and we've offered uh, the triple lock to staff within BTP to give them assurance about their future. So, and officer, one of the key issues about moving towards having railway policing integrated into Police Scotland is to create that single command structure. Members have raised how issues around how we'll deal with matters relating to counter-terrorism. Who provided the armed policing at our transport hubs over the last couple of weeks? It's been Police Scotland. Who provides the specialist counter-terrorism policing in Scotland on our railways as well? It is Police Scotland. And alongside the specialist road policing, alongside the specialist airport policing, armed policing, border policing, underwater policing, counter-terrorism policing, all of that is delivered in Scotland by Police Scotland. And the benefits we get from having an integrated force in Scotland is that we can make sure we have a single command structure in dealing with these matters. If anything, recent events have demonstrated the benefits of having a single command structure to be able to respond to them much more effectively should and when they ever occur. That's one of the real key benefits that come from how we can deliver integrated policing through the integration of BTP. And the other issue, presiding officer, that this bill will deliver is a level of scrutiny and accountability over railway policing in a way that we have never had in this country. Having made the decision on a cross-party basis to devolve its responsibility, we are creating provisions that will ensure not only do trade unions and others have a say in how railway policing will be delivered in Scotland, but this parliament will have oversight in a way that simply has never been there, ensuring that railway policing is delivered in a way that we consider appropriate for our railways here in Scotland. General Officer, this is a bill that will deliver more effective and better policing in Scotland, creating a safer Scotland, and one that I would call on all the chamber to support this evening. Thank you. That concludes our stage three debate on the Railway Policing Scotland Bill. The next item of business is consideration of motion 6278 in the name of Margaret Mitchell on behalf of the selection panel on the appointment of the Scottish Information Commissioner. And I would call on Margaret Mitchell to speak to and move the motion. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the motion in my name as a member of the cross-party selection panel, which was established under our standing orders to invite members to nominate Darren Fitzhenry to Her Majesty the Queen for appointment as the Scottish Information Commissioner. The selection panel was chaired by the presiding officer and other members were Claire Adamson, David Stewart and Andy Whiteman. Louise Rose, the independent assessor, oversaw the process and has provided the Parliament with a validation certificate confirming that the process complied with good practice and that the nomination is made on merit after a fair, open and transparent process. As members will be aware, the role of the Scottish Information Commissioner is to enforce and promote Scotland's freedom of information regime, which gives people anywhere in the world access to information held by more than 10,000 public authorities in Scotland. The Commissioner's role is important as it supports the openness, transparency and accountability of public bodies. Turning now to our nominee, Darren Fitzhenry, who was the unanimous choice of the panel from a strong field of candidates called to interview. Darren is currently a senior legal officer in the RAF legal branch and heads up its legal advisory team. He is an LLM graduate of the University of Glasgow and has worked as a solicitor in private practice and public service. 
His experience in the, the development, implementation and application of regulatory systems, legislation and international arrangements is extensive. And his wide portfolio of legal practice has included the application of a freedom of information regime. regime. I believe that Darren will be an enthusiastic and effective commissioner who will ensure that Scotland remains a respected world leader in openness and transparency. I'm sure the Parliament will want to wish Darren every success in his new role. I move the, ma the motion, presiding officer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move now to decision time. There are two questions to be put as the result of today's business. The first question is that motion 6356 in the name of Hamza Youssef on the Railway Policing Scotland Bill at Stage 3 be agreed. And we'll move straight to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result, of the, vo the result of the vote on motion 6356 in the name of Hamza Youssef is yes 68, no 53. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed and the Railway Policing Scotland Bill is passed. And the final question is that motion 6278 in the name of Margaret Mitchell on the appointment of the Scottish Informationer Information Commissioner be agreed. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Gillian Martin on Not On My Screen. We'll just take a few moments for members to change seats. <laughs>